welcome everybody for a, a good fun round table we're going to have for a little bit here. Uh, everybody obviously is a graduate of the 1950s. This is an idea we came up with in conjunction with the 75th anniversary of the school. Um, as you can see, Cheryl's got a couple of really uh, uh, intriguing things to talk about, look at, maybe identify, which is something that's going to be useful with you guys because you remember a lot of these things that we maybe don't know. How's that sound? Sounds good. Everybody knows everybody, right? We don't need any yep. introductions. Yeah. Fantastic. Didn't want to interrupt y'all, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Now, obviously, I'm Sean McMullen, the alumni director, and Cheryl Rowe, our archivist, and one of the, I guess, the most tenured faculty member? Yes. Fantastic. Wow. So, Cheryl, why don't you go ahead and talk about um, how this benefits you and, and uh, your goals? Okay. Well, of course, the purpose of the archives is to maintain the history of the school. But basically, we just want to know what was, what was life like at Jesuit in the 50s? How did you guys get to Jesuit? Let's go around and just talk about that. As an eighth grader, how did Jesuit become a part of your radar? Well, I had I was eight years across the street from Holy Trinity. I just walked across the street <laughs> for another okay. four, four years. Well, and back then, Jesuit was the only Catholic high school in Dallas, which kind of brought everybody there from all over town. Yeah, they, they did so. come. They did come from all over town. All over, yeah. yeah. Going to the Sacred Heart Cathedral, the the school, the elementary school there. Then, uh, it just seemed that everybody more or less just assumed you were going to go to Jesuit. Right. Oh, yeah. And uh, we had to take the entrance exams. And for me to pass the entrance exam, you know, they really wanted us to come to Jesuit. <laughs> no question about it. But what was amazing, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the tuition at that time was fifty dollars a semester. That's correct. Hundred dollars a year. Hundred dollars a year. And the lady that was in the office was. Mrs. Norris. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And bless her heart, I never had the fifty dollars, so I had to pay it out. And she always understood. But it just seemed like everybody just there was only one place to go, and that's Jesuit, unless you were going to go to North Dallas or Woodville. Well, where I well, lived, you, that was the only kicked. place you didn't go. Yeah, was right. Jesuit. Yeah, I right. lived in South Dallas, <laughs> and if you got on the bus and you didn't have an A or an S on your letter jacket, you knew to be really, really quiet. <laughs> yeah. I have no idea how my mother signed me up. I don't think she'd ever been to Jesuit. Uh, we moved here from San Antonio, and I was told I was going to Jesuit, which was on the other side of town. Yeah. I came because my dad told me I had to. I made a case for him that I wanted a football scholarship into college, and I didn't think I could get enough publicity at Jesuit. He let me talk about that for about two months. And he said, no, you're wasting an awful lot of time. I said, you're going to go to Jesuit. <laughs> and so we found a way for me to get here. He would bring me in sometimes 5.30 or 6 o'clock in the morning. My, uh, I didn't want to go to Jesuit. I wanted to go to Woodrow. It was where my friends, that are, guys that I ran around with were there. And, and God bless my mom, you know, I, much as I hate to admit it, she knew a hell of a lot more than I did, that's for sure. <laughs> and... and but we didn't have money, not even hundred dollars. I mean, not anything. And she talked with uh, Monsignor Daly, who was uh, the pastor at uh, St. Edwards in Dallas. And um, he came over and talked to Father Jules May. And uh, the, between the two of them, they saw to it. I came to, to Jesuit. My mom did not like the guys I was running around with. And, you know. Thank God that she brought me over here, and uh, uh, we were just talking about how the brotherhood, it, it just grows and grows every, the further you go in life, the, the more the brotherhood exists of Jesuits. Uh, I know my first experience, that I, thing that I remember at Jesuit was uh, one of the first mornings, it was, so uh, we were taking up the stairs to go to confession, and Father Tynan was hearing <laughs> profession, the confessions. Well, right there was Ray Ruwalt and Cardi Vance and Gary and me and Bud Knizel. We were all sitting around in line getting ready to go to confession. Well, Bud's up at the front of the line and he goes into confession and he comes out and he says, go to the other priest, go to the other priest. Why? We said, what's, what's wrong? He says, he knows exactly who you are when you come to confession. Father Tynan 
every every for afterwards he would say, "Now, Bud, for your <laughs> penance, say, you know." And his, that was Bud. He said, "He'll know exactly who you are." He said, "Go to somebody else," you know. Way before the face to face. Right? Oh yeah, that we would, none of us had even met him, and and uh, he uh, that was probably the very first thing I remember about Jesuit. I heard him say one day when in that same environment where we were lined up. Somebody went in, I remember who it was, and he said, You did what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could hear it all over the channel. I tell you, the, uh, I was mentioning that I didn't know y'all had Scholastic, still had Scholastic, which was so important because I had Staub. I guess he was like a homeroom teacher for me or something. He seemed like, I had him for several classes, and he was in charge of the cheerleaders. Well, I, I was I was I was a tumbler, I was a gymnast, and so naturally he wanted me to be on the cheerleading squad. So which was great as a freshman, that was wonderful. But after the second year, I got so involved in, in the sport that I, cheerleading was taking time away from me actually training. So I went to him and said, I, I can't do cheerleading this next year with you. He said, well, I'll tell you this. He says, you're not the brightest student I've ever had, <laughs> and it'd be pretty hard for you to pass my courses unless you're a cheerleader. <laughs> and I said, well, that changed, <laughs> that changed the whole complexion of the thing <laughs> right then. I said, yes, 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 brother. So I was a cheerleader for four years for him, but the, the, the brothers, the priests, uh, were very influential to me, uh, after I left Jesuit, the uh, I don't know what they installed in you. Uh, I've said this several times. I, I don't know what Jesuit does to a young man that makes them bond. It, there's something, and I'm sure it's still the same as it was. And it, it just like our class meets once a month. What few of us is left to just sit around and talk and. and about the days, etc. I, I, I would, I've often wondered what it is, because it happened to my son that went here, and it happened to me and to Joe, all of us. What, what is it that they install in us to to be sitting here right now? It's a magic, and I don't know if it was the the brothers or the priest or what it was. I have no idea. Well, I think we didn't have any girls around to distract us. <laughs> no, we, 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 we sure not. thought about them after the class. <laughs> I'd like to say something about the teachers. I mean, it was it was something that you got from the teachers. I, I, I came to Jazz, but got a, did well in the entrance exam and was put in the A class. And, you know, I never had studied very hard because I was always making good grades. And, my first, my first report card, I got a below a, a, an 80 from my Latin teacher. And that's the only thing that got, kept me from getting a four year of being spent. But it motivated me to, to work a little bit harder because I thought I was smarter than them. Now on graduation, I found out from dear old Father Weber that I actually made about an 82, but he gave me a 79 because I was smarter than he wanted me to study. <laughs> so. Do you remember Mr. Tiblier? How the name is there. He was uh, my, my freshman year. Tiblier, yeah. he, my freshman year, uh, he, he taught one C. <laughs> I was in one B. And we had a, one class with, with him. He came in and taught us all. I don't remember what it was. And I can remember him one of the kids in the class was teasing somebody else, making fun of them and everything else, and Mr. Tiblier said, that will stop now. And and he kept it on, kept on doing it, it was, uh, gosh, I can't remember the guy. He walked over to the guy, picked up his desk and everything, and threw him out the door. And he turned around and he says, maybe you gentlemen would listen to me the next time I talk. <laughs> The Jesuits were great at, at competition, you know, in every single aspect. You were expected to compete, and later in life, it served everybody well. It really served everybody yeah, definitely. well. Definitely. And it didn't make any difference what level you were in the class. No, absolutely I mean, uh, not. You know, everybody knew where you were, and, you know, uh, 
nobody ever challenged me because I was kind of in the middle of the group, you know, and there was people way at the top and people at the bottom, and it, it we, we were all the same, uh, just all the same. You know, talking about things that you remember, um, I don't know why this left quite an impression on me, but as y'all remember, every morning we met downstairs in a in a big yeah. area. I don't know what the days are. That's right. right, and they stood up on this little podium and gave you what's going to go for the day, and then we'd all march upstairs to the chapel. And I think it was optional for the for the kids that were not Catholic. They did not have to go to chapel, if I remember right. They did not, but they all went. And that left such an impression on me. And I've always said, if I ever won the lottery, I would build a chapel for Jesuit that they would all be able to, to attend that. That just made an unbelievable uh, uh, impression on me for some reason. I, I don't know what it was. I don't Jamel, did we have a, did we have a non-Catholic in your class? God, I don't remember, Joe. Come I don't have, think we had a... I don't remember enough. Uh, I don't remember. I don't I don't we never distinguished. No, we uh, it was never a, we're Catholic, you're a Catholic, and I'm no, a Catholic, and you're never, not. It was just never... Uh, that was never even... Discussed. Uh, discussed. Uh, the most segregation we ever had was the A class and the B class. That, that and you were it. supposed to strive if you were in B to somehow your junior year, if you remember, you might get lucky and get moved in with the A class. But, uh, you know, and that I, was more competition, and that made it more competitive yeah, along the line. That, 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 that was the only, I mean, there was not Well, you, you were in the B class. Yeah. And I was in the A class, but I never thought, <laughs> we thought. Oh, you knew I was a dummy. <laughs> Tell me that. Well, I didn't want to say that. But yeah, but I, I knew you. <laughs> but no, we, I, I, we, weren't we never competed. No. Yeah, but I'd run into people over the mm. years and they went to jail and they said, were you in the A class? Or B yeah. class? <laughs> right. I'm just trying to be nice. <laughs> yeah, when I'm talking about the A class, I will assure you that every one in the A class didn't make A's or B's. That's true. That's right. <laughs> I think I was you were C there. minus A. <laughs> so it was, that, that wasn't how they distinguished them, believe me. <laughs> Father Sweeney was the principal, guys, in 52, 53. Father Abel was the secretary. Father Curry was the principal. Um, pre Father Sweeney was the president. Father <laughs> Malloy was the athletic director. And Robert A. Tynan, Society of Jesus, was the guidance counselor. Guidance counselor. Well, well so was, uh, was Earl Johnson back then the teacher? Uh, no. Mr. Johnson? Earl maybe. came in our freshman year. Was our freshman year? Because he was my, he was, uh, he was in head charge of B, yeah. one B. Well, I was telling a couple of guys earlier when when we graduated, his hair was stark white, right. and it was it was solid black. But that first year there, we gave, we gave him a few headaches. <laughs> there was another one there that was who had the Glee Club. Um, he was a, a Mister Scholastic also. Um, we put on uh, my senior year the Pirates of Penzance. Mm -hmm. And Skippy McCaffrey sang lead, and there were a bunch of pirates, and there were a bunch of policemen. God, gosh, this name's going to come to me in a minute. But he was directing the whole thing. And man, he was, I mean, he got into everything he did. He said, okay, now we're coming to the fight scene, and you pull your swords. He said, for God's sakes, don't swing your swords around, because at that time the lights went off. And there was a big clanking and everything, and when it came about, the cops were over, the police were over the pirates or something. And in the middle of a rehearsal, the lights went out, click, 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 and somebody went, oh! And he turned the lights on, and, and I forget who it was that was over there, was holding his, had brought in ketchup, and he was holding it over his eyes like this, oh, and he moaned and moaned. And he, went, he came over there and he said, oh my God, let me see. And he pulled it like this and he goes like, he goes, strap, strap was the word that we you know we got you and everything. And, uh, but that, that was, uh, I cannot remember that guy's name. I was going to teach him back then. Those two pages somewhere in there. Father Herlong. That's who it was. Uh, he came into our class one time. I guess I'm the only one telling funny stories because I guess I was in trouble all the time. But um, he had a class one time, and what we did was we took 
a uh, radio, a little portable radio, and opened up one of the kids' locker and put it in the kids' locker and shut it and turned it on. And it was playing, and so he comes in, he sits down, he says, son, turn off the radio, please, and everybody just didn't move. And turn, turn off the radio, please. And we started laughing. And he goes up and looked around, and he goes over to the lockers and he starts listening like this and he looks at everybody and he takes his keys out to the combination lock opens it up pulls out the radio he said thank you gentlemen for my new portable radio and he goes walks down the next day he comes in there's a radio blasting do you remember this there's a radio there's a radio blasting back in the back again and he says don't you guys ever learn he says now i can take this in and go out and sell it and buy me a case of beer. He says, you don't ever learn. So he goes back and he unlocks the lock. No radio, still going. Opens up the next lock, opens up the lock, opens up the lock over here. We, we tilted the lockers down and taped the radio to the back of the <laughs> locker and shut it. <laughs> and he said, somebody, will you please shut this damn radio off, you know? So we tilted the locker and but he, he was really, he put up with a lot from us, but he was really a great guy. You know, the th I think a minute ago we talked about men for others. They taught us to be men for others without us even knowing what men for others right. was okay. until the, the catch flavor of men for others got in here. We were all men for others, I believe. And that's what they, that's loyalty. I mean... You could probably go out and if I had any trouble, every one of those priests would have come and fought for you. I guarantee you. I really think that what the Jesuits did is whether you came from St. James or whether you came from Highland Park, you just got the impression that to get ahead in life, you had to work hard yeah. and you had to be disciplined. You know, and you didn't have to be the smartest guy in the world. I mean, I, but but they always challenge you that you could do better than whatever you were doing. Some years ago, I was here for a ceremony, and uh, my kids had come in for the ceremony, and they put in the program my report card. And it was my senior year, and I was 84. Of course, there was tons of guys ahead of 84. And I asked, I said, Jesus, Father Postel, I said, you, you, I had kids who come in for this. Why did you put my report card in there? And he says, because you could have done better. <laughs> I thought, they never give up. <laughs> but that was, the, that was the feeling I always had here, that you just, you had to compete because they did. They came here with not much. They were invited here by the, by the bishop, uh, kind of a cult group out here in North, uh, North Dallas, so to speak, in those days. There weren't many Catholics in Dallas. The neighborhood I came from, there were no Catholics. Everybody went to Adamson or Sunset. One of the things we heard in the 40s was a, almost an anti-Catholic rhetoric in the athletic endeavors. Oh, no question about it. Can you all speak to that? Yeah, well, I, I can give you a good example of it. Uh, P.C. Cobb was the, yeah. was the athletic director of the city schools. And I assure you, he was not going to let our 1949 football team play any Catholic school. He'd been watching them for some time. They could not get a game with the city schools at all because they went undefeated and they had four guys or five guys that got into Division I schools and, and he wouldn't do it. And the next year, he scheduled us against Sunset, which was picked for and won the state that year, and Adamson was number two in the city. He, he just, come on, Jesuit, you can play us now. And of course, Sunset beat us like 36 to six or 36 to nothing or something like that. But we tied Adamson. And after that game, our athletic director and a group of us were walking diagonally across the field of the bus. P.C. Cobb comes out from the other side and Father Swing, 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 walk, was walking towards him, stuck out his hand. He didn't even act like Swing existed. He went, he had his head in the air and he just walked right by. Wouldn't even talk to him. I can remember that, that uh, this, yeah. this picture here is about our basketball team and we played Garland. We'd won eight in a row and I can remember when we beat Garland walking off the court that night and there was a lot of FU Catholics who so we, we walked oh. off the court. There was a oh, lot I'll of tell you another story about that. We had this when we got the first uh, black students in here. Yeah. 
and our coaching staff was pretty critical about you know per, pretty careful about it. Was but, Arthur Allen, wasn't it? Yes, Arthur, Arthur Allen. Allen. Yeah. And he was a great athlete. And you remember the story about what happened with uh, he went we had a practice practice a track meet and he entered in one, two, three races at one of the other schools. We went to their facilities. And Cobb called uh, boy, I just went blind. Called the, the athletic director here at Jesuit on Monday after that track meet on a Saturday and said, Don't ever bring that mm -hmm. so and so back on our campuses again. And if you do, I'll never schedule you in any sport. Well, that was in the late 50s, I guess, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. Who was the football player with you guys that was deaf that wound up leaving and going Wood, down the Wood, Wood, Wood. 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 Yeah. 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 Wood. He was yeah. he was ahead of us. Right. Was he? Okay. Yeah. He, he left for the school Bob, hospital, Bob Wood, I think, right? I mean, I think he was totally deaf. He was. He, he wasn't in the beginning. Up until he was about five or six, maybe seven, yeah. he, he could hear. Uh, but an interesting story about him. He, he was able to go through Jesuit with good grades, and and he had nobody. There was nobody in Jesuit suited or trained, you know, for that problem. But somehow he figured out how to do it. We scheduled Don Rossi scheduled the school for the deaf for a game one year, and we played them uh, at Highlander Stadium, and they were they were giving all their signals. For, wide open, you know, and, and old Bob's over there reading them all. <laughs> and they couldn't understand why every time they came through old, there were four guys waiting up. <laughs> this happened too a little bit later. That was, that was yeah. a year after yeah. I had gone, I think, when, uh, wasn't it Detroit came down and practiced with them? Was that? No, no. That was the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland, Cleveland, Browns. Browns. Cleveland, Browns. Cleveland Browns. I got that story. You want to hear it? Yeah, tech, go. Like had scheduled, I, would, I believe it was Bonham. Was it Bonham the first game? Bonham was our okay, first game. So he had scheduled this game with Bonham, and he he and the coach, of uh, Bonham coach, decided they wouldn't they wouldn't scout. Hi, Bonham. Exchange man. Bonham, we're going to have you sit next to John over there, right over there in the Bonham, left. you were invited? Sure is <laughs> invited, but I don't get up early. You know, you know, 80 years yeah. old. He yeah. Just, yeah. He's he's late. He has to make an appointment. We were going right to do right here. I thought we were going to do confession. Sit down. Well, we can do that too. I mean, that's what Paul does all. You know. We're, How you doing? We held the meeting until you got here. So. I was telling a story about a like here, uh, about a week before the bottom game. Lincoln made a deal. He knew Paul Brown of the Cleveland Browns. He had told Paul Brown, he said, you know, you're going to be staying in the Stonely Hotel. Now, he said, that's not very far from our campus. He said, we got plenty of space, and, you know, we'll be working out, too, because it's going to be the start of the season before school starts. So they did. Lank gets a call from the bottom coach, and he is raising all kinds of hell. He's saying, you lied to me. You know, you, you told me that your team, was, we were pretty equally balanced. And what, what about that big guy that's kicking field goals from 50 yards up? What about that, that quarterback that's throwing 65-yard passes? What about these four guys, these big tackles, you know? And, 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 and like said, he said, you weren't looking at the Jesuit Rangers, you were looking at the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. You know, Ray Ruwald and I were water boys for that game okay. that year. And uh, I'll never forget, one of the guys come off the field, his arm was bleeding, and uh, he pulled a tooth out of his forearm. And he said, I've been after that SOB for four years. Because <laughs> back then, no face masks, sure. you know, at the time, they were just coming in. We had face masks in high Our school. senior year. Was it just one year? I th I, well, uh, what was the guy's name? Marietta. 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 Marietta came Marietta. out with those plastic, plastic masks. Plastic masks. So then they came we had a bar across. One bar. Yeah, one bar. We had a bar across. Uh, we, you know, y'all are talking about helmets. Father May, there's a joke that goes again about Father May. He said when he buys socks, he buys them one at a time. When we played as when I played as a freshman uh, at Jesuit football, we had these wonderful leather helmets that had the little <laughs> rubber strap that hung down under here, and he only had twelve of them. And when one of us would run in to substitute for the other, on the way out, one would take his helmet off and give it to the other guy. Another guy would put the helmet on to come in and play. So, you know, I get the story I like to tell all of my acquaintances about our football coach, Lang Smith, when we played Carrollton our senior year. Yeah. 
And uh, we went out there on their feet. They had no grass out there at all. And it had been raining for days. Yeah. And it was sloppy, muddy out there. And we go in the locker room at halftime, and I think the score was six to nothing. So, like says, all right, everybody, take off your pads, your jerseys, your pants. Just keep your helmet and your shoes. And then he says, all right, all you guys that have been playing, go over to somebody your size and put on their uniform. Dry, <laughs> clean, nice, weighed about 20 pounds less. Mm -hmm. And we went out the second half, and the, of course they thought that the subs were starting the second half. Well, it turned out, we're out there running, it's like no weight at all, you know, and we ended up beating them. And nobody, nobody believes that story, but it actually, it actually it happened. happened. Now, how about golf? Uh, Aren't you a golfer? Yes, I was a golfer. Uh, well, how'd y'all how'd y'all do? We didn't have really any tournaments. Oh yeah, so we any? went and played. Uh, uh, well, we went to the Southwest Recreational over at Meadowbrook, but that was statewide, you know. And we, yeah, <laughs> you know, back to Marietta, you know, he was a big fan of uh, hockey, but a guy broke his nose or got hit with a puck. So he said, well, I, you know, it's, 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 what can we do? And so he goes to his dental office and he makes a piece of piece. plastic to go across the guy's nose, which was prologue to these, these masks. Yes, they were, yeah. So I remember Walter McAdams. Mm -hmm. And these were when the masks were inside the helmet. And, and he just got blasted nose bleeding, all that kind of thing, and you couldn't get the blood out. Right. And so, you know. Well, when, when, they, when he came back, he had changed it, though, and then we got another helmet. Yeah, deal. Another version. This was attached to the helmet yeah. with leather straps up here where you could open, flip, put yeah. it on and yeah. take it off this way, and then it had a little groove on the side that fit into the sides mm -hmm. of the helmet. How many athletic teams did we have in those days? You had football, basketball, baseball. We started a golf team right there. We had a golf team. Yeah. Golf. Yeah. And we actually had bowling. Also. Yeah. Bowling. Yeah. bowling. Tennis. Bowling. When did bowling? Tennis. 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 I saw something here about bowling. The only reason I remember that is. How many sports do you have now, Sean? I believe 21. A question for you guys. Let's talk about, mm -hmm. we talk about athletics pretty heavily. Let's talk about extracurriculars like debate. Philanthropic, uh, you know, theater. What, what, what did you guys, uh, Phil Thespic, pardon me, I mispronounced well, it. could probably. <laughs> yeah, please, well, let's talk a, about some a, of the other clubs. That was a big part of my life. <laughs> yeah. and I guess for me, a small kid with a big, loud voice. And I knew I was small, but I didn't know I had a loud voice <laughs> until I tried out for, as a freshman, for the debate, gold medal debate. And I, I'll never forget going in the classroom and you had to read something. And um, Jock Weber, remember Jock? Oh, yeah. So I got up to do the, the reading and all of a sudden this big old loud voice comes out. And uh, it, Jock said, uh, would you read that again? And I read it again. And uh, so from that time on, Elocution, freshman through senior year, debate and gold medal debate was an important part of my life. Yeah. I learned later in life that I always have thought they should make that a mandatory. You had to take debate in some form in school because there are so many opportunities in life where you have to stand up Absolutely. in front of people to sell something. I mean, you're doing it whether you're the sales manager, the CEO, or you're selling somebody. And uh, the people that have, most people have such a difficult time with that. They really do. And I just, I've always thought if you could do that, you know, if they could teach each kid, at least he took one course during high school and, and have it to debate. We had one of our boys was a debater too. And it made all the difference in, in, in really made all the difference in his life. I mean, where he went to college after that, or where he, you know, later on, everything, he was a debater. It's a sense of confidence. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Confidence. You can articulate sure. something Absolutely. and make sense out of it. And to be able to stand up in front of people, and Jamil was there at Mass every Sunday, <laughs> except when. <laughs> and, and, I always uh, sit down front so I can hear you. That's right, that's right. But, but it really does. I, I, I would agree with that. Absolutely. Well, don't you think that carried you through, through your Notre Dame years, and even now, your homilies are so that you're able to do this, and I think you might have got your beginning 
right here. Oh, I think yeah. that's it. Definitely. No question about it. Yeah, because people I mean, come to your to your mass to to to, to listen to absolutely. you. Absolutely, no you question about it. it. So I think it was a carryover in what it did for you when you just started. He gave you that confidence. Well, I've often said that what the Jesuits did for me is they um, they saw things I didn't see. And they enabled me to see those things and to do it. They encouraged it. And, and, but they could see things in a kid that, that we couldn't see in ourselves. And, and, and I think that there was a real genius in that. So I think, I think that, the, the, you know, I think of old Bob Tynan. I can remember coming in with a Western Union money order once a month from my brother in the Marine Corps for my, my tuition. And Ms. Norris would take the money order, and then that back room where Tynan was, as you know, behind her back there out here, Johnny, come on back. I'd go back and I'd get more mentoring in 15 minutes That's than right. I got for an entire year. And yeah. he would just talk. He was such an incredible guy. And That's I right. Just a huge, deep feeling. And, uh, Tynan brought me into his office. I was a senior, and with my mother and dad, and told them that he thought I should go to trade school and not to college. Well, you know, that just, right then I knew, what I, well, I knew exactly where I wanted to go and what I was going to do, but he wasn't sure about that. So he told my mother and dad that. And as we walked out, I walked out, and my dad stood there with him for a little bit, and Tiny told my dad, he says, he'll go to college now because I know him. <laughs> so we put a little fire under him right there. Oh, and he did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. When you I walked out, Illinois, I right? said, when you decided on Illinois. And after, after I got in, Illinois accepted me and I got a ride and all that, all that good stuff. After my freshman year, I was first semester, I was put on the dean's list. And I made it a point to come back to Jesuit and put it on his desk. <laughs> and he just, he just grinned. He just grinned. He had worked it. He had worked it. Yeah. He, had worked it. He, he worked it. He didn't miss the boat on one guy that would do <clears throat> He called me in the office one day and asked me if I had ever considered joining the priesthood. I think you mentioned this. Don't think so, buddy. That's right. Even I was asked that. He probably ran the group. One of a hundred he called in, you know. Quite a show. I was going to ask about locations and how the Jesuits influenced Milam. I believe we're coming to you, sir. You know, when I got out of when I got out of Jesuit, I didn't want to go to Notre Dame, and I did go to Notre Dame, and and that all during those years, I would come back, talk to Tynan, kind of converse, converse, and something about the priesthood came up. But it was obviously an influence, home and Jesuit and church and uh, all that was a, an important item in our life. And I had an uncle who's a priest, and it was just. That, but uh, when I told him I was going, I want. I thought I might go to seminary. He he just, you know, he he just saw things in people. He knew his. I mean, he was a psychological genius in working you. That's right. And he knew you. Yeah. Yeah. And he and he was and, and it just just marvelous at the way he did it. And then in the seminary, I'd come back and talk to him on a regular basis and visit with him. Yeah. It was a big influence in my life, obviously. And I'll never forget that. I don't know why Curry projected to me so much authority. It wasn't that he said a lot. He just projected to me authority. He was big. He was big. He was big. But he was more than that. He, he was, was austere. Yeah, he was scary in a ditch. Oh, yes. Police yeah. whistle. Uh, yeah. Well, that police whistle on everybody. Yeah. I don't oh. think I told Milo this, but I was telling a couple of them earlier. My mother came over once to school here. I don't think she'd ever been. And it was mother's luncheon or something. And so she gets off the bus and she's walking up to the front, goes in the school and Father Curry's walking with his, as you knew, behind his back, walking up and down. And she introduced herself and said she was here to, to try and, and uh, talk to and find her son. And all he said to her was, Madam, if I were you, I'd start with Penance Hall. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know if I was in it or not that day, but that was just his. But he but you know, always was authority to me. to me. Guys, tell me about what it was like with the girls' schools in Dallas. What, was, what were your dances like, homecomings? 
Tell me a little bit about that. Were they orchestrated by the students? Did the Jesuits put them on? I remember if I worked it out right, I could take the press and holler bus, and when I got off, the girls from Ursula were just getting ready to get on the bus to go the other way. So I had it all figured out. <laughs> but I don't remember too much about that. I think I think uh, Ursuline, uh, Marichi became Ursuline our senior right, year, Mary yes. was and had their year. first prom in the building over there called Ursuline. I remember going to the prom. And technically, the girls had to call the boys <clears> to invite <throat> them to the dance. The boys, the boys, the boys, the boys, the boys, remember it's about a dance was a Jesuit, and the girls came there. And there was this little blonde who was brand new at Ursuline. She she hadn't been there in the first two years. This was I guess in the third year. And I danced with her a couple of times, and, and I'd go back and sit down by JD, and he said. You liking her pretty good. And I said, but she seems to be nice. And then somebody else came up and danced with her. And it was right at the break. And this guy went ahead and took her over to the break in the concessions. And so JD said, you want me to take him out and outside and stomp him? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, I got it, JD. I got it. You got to remember these girls at Ursuline also went to grammar school with a lot of them. Sure. Yeah, that's true, too. So it wasn't like right. a. Right, right. But was, that's true. He knew them all. Well, I, I tell you, uh, the one dance I remember was the snowball that they had at the uh, name, forget the name of the place, but th she went to Ursuline. This is a group of the, the Shades. We were all athletes and this is a group that we, com we went and went into a talent show that was at the snowball. Well, we got up and sang. And I forget who, what the, I think it was Father Tynan. The whole performance, he came and stood up and looked at us like this, stood right in front of the stage. Wonder his picture's not there. And we got through singing after that. Everybody clapped and the votes went in and the father went over to look at the votes and he scratched it out. We won. And he came over to us and he said, I scratched your name out you all will be suspended if you ever do anything like this again. I don't know what was so upsetting. The songs we sang were, Annie Had a Baby Can't Work No More, Sexy Ways, Lovey Dovey, and to our encore was I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas, and that was when Father was standing up there. We were, I, 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 I'm dreaming of a white Christmas, you know? And he was, he never broke, I never broke his stare and everything else. <laughs> Several of you have had children go to Jesuit, and I'm kind of interested to hear how that decision was made. How did that prolong your Jesuit experience? What did that mean to you? And I, you know, I opened that up. I know several of you have had children. I, uh, children. I was, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, right. yeah. I, was in, uh, I was in El Paso working for Farrah as the uh, executive VP for sales. I was a pretty young guy. And uh, my wife came to me one day and said, uh, we're going to have to move to Dallas so our kids can go to Jesuit. So we moved and, and uh, came to see Father Coke. And Father Coke told Sylvia that afternoon, he said, we're full for next year. You can't, uh, he said, I can put them on the waiting list. But he said, and, and, and I'd already talked him into moving. So I'm thinking, my God, they're going to go to Lake Highlands. The other ones are going to go to Forest Meadows or whatever. And uh, actually, I wasn't to tell the story until he had died. But he... Uh, he said, I'm going to send a letter back home with you to the boys, you know, for whatever. Got back, opened the letter, and it said, uh, Dear James and uh, Jeff, welcome to Jesuit. With, with mine, he went to St. Patrick's, the boy. And when he was getting out of the eighth grade, he wanted to go to Richardson. And I said, but well, you know, J.J., uh, you, you need to go to Jesuit. He said, I, I don't want to go. All my friends are going to, to Richardson. And I said, I'll make a deal with you. You go one year to Jesuit, and if you don't like it and you still want to go, I'll buy it. So he did come. And after that one year, I said, well, he said, no, Dad, uh -uh, I'm staying. He loved it. That's I'm great. staying. And when he graduated and went off to school, he came back and told me, he says, he thanked me because he said he is so far ahead mm -hmm. of his classmates. Yeah. He said, this is a piece of cake compared to Jesuit. <laughs> and he thanked me for making him, giving him that year to make that decision. Roof, you coached here, taught here, student here. Tell us about it. What, what drew you to come back and make this your career? 
I was pretty heavily competing in diving and had an opportunity to represent the United States at the Pan Am Games and I screwed my arm up in a water safety show for the Red Cross at Fair Park diving. I took off and the Father May again and Al Ogletree, coach at uh, Jesuit, he was a college baseball coach, came and found me and told me, you know, you can't do what you want to do and you ought to be able to teach some kids. Well, I was in engineering at the time and I changed my major to athletics, health, physical education, recreation and was coaching part-time here and Jim Walsh said he would sponsor me to do my student teacher here at Jesuit and when I graduated uh, Bill Durick and um, Father May had an influence on me coming back over here and being able to start teaching and coaching full time. And uh, I know I got up this morning and I was shaving and I nicked myself and I was bleeding blue and gold. <laughs> <laughs> and Ruth, how long were you? You were here from 80 until 98? Yeah. It's really funny because when get before the couple of, well, a week before Gary passed away, we were sitting back and talking about all of the young men who take the time out to come and say, gosh, thanks a lot for coaching us and being with us and teaching us and giving us the opportunity to do the things we did. And Gary and I talked about it and we both agreed to the fact that, you know, they're saying how much they did for us, but it doesn't compare. I mean, how much we did for them, but it doesn't compare what they really did to us right. and gave That's us. No, I agree with you. And yeah. it was uh, That's great. It was a contribution that really added to my life was these young men that all put me part of their family. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's really kind of funny, you know, you talk about the Jesuits and the brotherhood and and all of those really good things that stay with that stayed with me and you all the, the your whole life. The one guy we haven't mentioned very much today who, who impacted a lot of lives, but different than, than uh, Father Tyner was Father Coke. Father Coke. Uh, I was in Father Coke's first class as, with, as John was. Remember the day he walked in and wrote on the board, Patrick J. Coke, S.J. And everybody goes, oh, God. He turns around and he was like 23 years old or something. That's right. But over the years, he touched an awful lot of lives for oh, people. Did. Very different guy than Father Tynan. Very softer, very gentler, more, you know. But uh, I can tell you from a... 60-year association. He was uh, he was a terrific guy. I tell you what, he was very special to me. For some reason, I don't know. My mother had a, a relationship with with Coke. Very, they were very communicated. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, this man, when mom, dad got sick, he was always around. And when we buried him, he was there. And when mom did, he was also there. He was always around. How he knew, I have no idea. Jesuit was their parish. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this was their this was <clears throat> their community, and, and I know from my work in education and, and, and being principal and Tyler and so forth and so on that the school is the second most important influence on a kid's life next to the parents. The nation education, the Jesuit education, was an education about balance. And we took care of our bodies, we took care of our brain, we took care of our spirit. And, and when those things were in balance, that, that was the best of the Jesuit education. Yeah, those guys really gave us a sense of balance about life and uh, that, uh, that just defines where we're at. Well, for sure, it it, it hasn't gone away in, in in its influence on me. And, you know, I'm 82, like you. And I'm 82, yeah. You know, you're gonna be there. <laughs> Anyhow, it's still working. Come on. It, it's it hasn't it hasn't diminished. No, I I would agree with yeah I'd agree with you, very much so.
I appreciate those thoughts. That's we very lucky. special. I think we were all lucky. Well, I, guys, y'all are family, and we love you, and I very much appreciate y'all coming here today and sharing your Jesuit memories, being a part of this. This is important to the history of the school. It's important to us, so please, from the bottom of our hearts, know thank you. 